Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Now we're going to read that entire passage, so I hope that you'll have that open in front of you by the time we get there. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, as we talk about the Messiah. So let's go ahead and go before God in prayer, and then we'll get right into our message. Father, we do thank you for all that you give us, and we thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here this morning, not only to greet each other and to encourage each other, Father, but most importantly, to be reminded um, of why we come together and why we celebrate who you are. Father, this morning as we read this passage and as we look at the, the word and we break it down and we begin thinking more about how you stepped into our world out of eternity, we are so thankful for that. But it's so good for us to be able to understand the biblical accounts so much deeper than what we normally just take them at. So bless us and be with us today. Open our minds to hear your word. And as we look at this passage, Father, made from this day forward, we see it differently than we ever did before. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So we continue our series this morning, and we're looking at passages that we've all read probably many times before, but I want us to look and to listen to them with new and attentive ears. And here's the reason why. Because the Lord has a way of using His Word to speak directly into our life at just the right time in a way that we've never heard it before, if we are willing to listen to Him. Now, John, in John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you believe what Jesus is saying, that he is the truth, and it is his truth that you and I need, in order that one day we will be in heaven with the Father, then we must seek the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus also said in John 8, 32, If you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So I pray that we all want our future to be better. I pray that we want our future to be more rooted in Christ and in his word. However, in order for our future to be changed, we must know scripture and the lessons in which it teaches because they are timeless and they apply to us no matter where we are in our life. So true freedom, according to Jesus, comes from knowing Scripture and following what it says. But what are we free from? Well, we know sin overall, but we can break that down to things that we all know better, like fear and shame and guilt and the culture, people's opinions, self-centeredness, self-pity, anger, and arrogance. Remember, we are told and we are reminded each and every single week there are only two ways that we can change our future. One is to the better. In other words, it is to study the Word of God and to allow the Word of God to not only change, but transform our thinking and our life. Or there's the second way. Just keep doing what the world wants you to do. And you're going to change, but it's going to be for the worse. And you can see that. I don't need to convince you of that. But it is your choice. You get to choose what you're going to do. So the question is, what will you do with this opportunity to change? Will you squander it or will you actually use it to change to become what God created you to be? Now this morning we're going to be looking at another familiar passage. We're looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And this is what it reads, if you'll follow along. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be a child and will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him his throne, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said, and then the angel left her. Now last week we began this journey to the birth of Jesus Christ, and we began the journey by speaking about Zechariah, who was actually visited or told by Gabriel that his wife Elizabeth would give birth to a son, and he was to be named John. He would prepare the way for the Lord. 
And we'll talk more about John, by the way, next week in our sermon. But this week we're going to read about another visit that Gabriel has to make to a young lady that we are all very familiar with. Her name is Mary. But there is much more to this biblical account than often goes unmentioned that we don't talk about. So I want to take a few minutes to look at this very important account so that we might try to understand it a little bit better and and understand a little bit more what's happening. So let's go ahead and look at our first point this morning. Our first point is the parents. Now, as we talk about the parents this week, I I want us to see that while the accounts of John and Jesus are very similar, they're also very different in several ways. And I want us to take note of some of the differences so that when we see what is happening, we don't consider it to be common to happen at at this, whether it was at this time or even in our time today. Last week, we saw the information about John's birth was being delivered to Zechariah, the father of John, also a priest who was serving at the altar before the most holy place, burning incense before worship. But this week, the announcement is to the mother, not to the father, but to the mother, a young peasant girl from Nazareth, which was located in Galilee, which, by the way, was a place not too highly thought of by everyone who not only lived in Israel, but even the surrounding areas of Israel. It was considered to be filled with useless and uneducated people. Now, I want you to listen to what many thought about Nazareth. John chapter 1, verses 43 through 46. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything, come from, anything good come from there, Nathaniel asked? Come and see, said Philip. So Nazareth, by the way, was not thought very highly of at all by the people of Israel. But once again, not only the people of Israel, but even the people in the surrounding countries as well. So while Zechariah and Elizabeth were of the priestly family and actively involved in the work of the temple, Mary's situation was quite different. Not the fact that she was less devoted to God, because that's not the case at all. But she is from very humble beginnings. So who are Mary and Joseph? Well, the fact is, I want to talk about them for a few minutes today But we have to look at Matthew in order to see who Joseph is. And in all reality, we don't know very much about either of them, if we're going to be honest. And you know what? Quite frankly, that's the way it should be. Sometimes I think we forget that. You see, while every person who is involved in any biblical account or the kingdom's work, as well as those who serve in the kingdom's work today are no less important, we cannot and we must not forget that the Bible only highlights and points to one person above all people, and that is the person of Jesus Christ and him alone. So let's go ahead and talk about Joseph. His Hebrew name means, may he add. Now the first record of the name Joseph is found in Genesis chapter 30, verse 24, when God allowed Rachel, who by the way was one of the wives of Jacob, became pregnant even after she was barren. Genesis chapter 30, verses 22 to 24. Then God remembered Rachel and listened to her and opened her womb and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son and said, she said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. And so Joseph, by the way, is a very common and well-respected name among the Jewish men. But oftentimes, people refer to this Joseph as a carpenter. And by the way, we have a tendency when we hear that phrase to equate carpentry to what you and I know it as today. And that is the fact of building homes with wood or doing finishing work with wood and so on and so forth. But that is not the case at all in first century Israel. Joseph is more of a woodworker stone cutter. That's what he was because houses were not made of wood in an area that does not, have, does not have wood plentifully like we do today. Houses usually were made of stone or hardened clay. So a carpenter actually would cut stones and the woodworking part, if you will, was usually for furnitures and utensils and plates and such. So not a carpenter in the sense we know carpentry. Now, by the way, this would have been the family business that not only Jesus would have had to learn, but also all the other sons of Joseph would have learned as well. James, Joseph, Simon, Judas, not Iscariot. Judas was a very common name as well. All half-brothers, if you will, of Jesus. So Joseph is a God-fearing man of faith who loves his wife Mary very much. Now we know this because when Mary is found to be pregnant, 
This would have been a great disgrace to both her and to him as well, meaning Joseph. And legally, by the way, he could have had Mary stoned to death for infidelity to him. But Joseph loved Mary, and he planned to divorce her quietly. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. But Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, this allows you and I to look into the heart of Joseph and to see how much he actually loved Mary. You see, while he could have publicly disgraced her, at the same time cleared his own name of any wrongdoing, he didn't. He was going to divorce her quietly so that she would not be ridiculed for the rest of her life. But then something happened to Joseph. Matthew 1, verses 20 through 22. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, this allows us to see the faith. So what he did with Mary allowed us to see the love in the heart of Joseph, but this allows us to see the faith that Joseph had in the Lord. Because when Joseph is shown this vision by the angel in his dream, he does not hesitate in any way, shape, or form. He does what he is told to do. Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she had given birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. By the way, the name Jesus is really important that you and I understand as well. Remember, Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Joshua. Now, in the Hebrew, it is pronounced Yeshua. So, in other words, Hebrew, Yeshua, is English, Jesus means the Lord saves. And that is exactly what Jesus did for every single one of us. He offers us the opportunity to be saved through his death, burial, and resurrection. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. But I think we also need to consider the tremendous responsibility that was being given to Joseph by the Lord when it comes to this task. Joseph had to provide for his family. Remember, they were both poor. Their families were poor. He had to get his wife to Bethlehem, a very long and very dangerous journey with a pregnant wife. He was responsible for raising Jesus and training him into manhood. He was told to take and flee to Egypt. And they remained there, by the way, till the death of Herod the baby killer was done. He was dead and gone. And then get his family back home, all the while raising a growing family, which is no easy task at all. And yet, God saw Joseph up for the task. Now, that says a lot about Joseph and his resolve to serve God even with everything he had in his life. But then there's Mary. Mary comes from the name Miriam. The name Mary actually means sea of bitterness. But the name was very important for Jewish women because the name is first actually mentioned in the book of Exodus in connection with Moses, his sister Miriam, who, by the way, took and placed him in the basket and followed him in the reeds along the Nile River as he was floating down. And much like Zechariah, Elizabeth, and Joseph, we do not really know a whole lot of information about Mary, but what we do know about her is extremely important. She was a virgin who was pledged to be married to Joseph. She was of the line of David. And by the way, so was Joseph. You remember reading that. And this is extremely important because the Messiah was to come through the line of David. And he has it on both sides. His mother and his father, if you will, the earthly man, meaning Joseph. And here's the big thing for Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, I want you to consider three things about Mary that were said. One, she is highly favored. Now, the Greek word karito is actually the English word for favored, and what it means is simply this, to bestow favor upon. In other words, this is a high favor, but it is bestowed upon you. It is given to you by God, not by men. That's exactly what it means. The second thing is that God was with her. Mary was not treading through life, if you will, walking alone 
the Lord was with her the whole way. And by the way, this is really a blessing when she realizes what she is being called to do. But the third thing is also very important. She was considered blessed among women. Remember, Elizabeth actually says this by inspiration of the Holy Spirit when, they, when she talks to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 42. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. Now, I want to point out one other thing here. Mary was troubled by the words of the angel because she really wasn't sure what this meant for her. Now, why is that important for us to notice? Because it actually shows that Mary is very humble. She wasn't arrogant as to think it's about time that God finally caught on that I've been trying to live a really good life. That's not her arrogance at all. Yet that's exactly what we see in the religious elite of her day. That's how they felt. That's how they lived. They believed and they publicly showed people that I am above you, that you're nothing compared to me. They were also believed and began to tell people that they were in a better relationship with God. Or better yet, they wanted to make sure that you noticed that God thought their ways were superior and better than your ways of living. But Mary and Joseph, when you consider their gentleness, when you consider their humility, their love, their obedience, and the desire to serve the Lord with their lives and all that he called them to do, regardless of the societal cost, we can easily see that God was perfect, as he always is, in his choosing. But why a couple with such a humble life? Well, God can do whatever he wants, but from our perspective, doesn't a humble and a simple life of obedience to Jesus mean so much more of a reachable Savior as opposed to the pompous lifestyle of the religious elite who believed that everybody else was beneath them? I think so. And I think you understand that as well. But what is meant by that word betrothal or pledged? What is meant by that to someone? It, does it mean the exact same thing that we mean when we say that we're engaged to someone? Actually, absolutely not. They're not the same word in any way, shape, or form. Engagement is the fact, or what we call being pledged to somebody, means that you've accepted a proposal, you have set a date, and you've made some promises to people, but legally you are not married in any way, shape, or form. A betrothal, or to be betrothed to someone, was a legal and binding commitment. It consisted of two parts, by the way. One, a formal agreement, which was witnessed by many people. And the bridal price or the dowry was paid, which was common at this time. And by the way, still even common in the Middle East today. And at that point, by the way, the bride and the groom are legally married. They are a husband and wife. However, the marriage is not consummated yet. Then there comes the second part, and that was this. The groom then would go and prepare a place for his family, whether it's build a house, purchase a house, fix it up. He would go and prepare that, and at some point, which that varied, would come back and take his wife so that they would establish their home. So when we read the words in Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and they gave him the name Jesus. Simply said, he took his wife home. By the way, they were already legally married to one another, but they did not consummate the marriage until after the birth of Jesus. That's important to keep in mind, because sometimes that word betrothal will confuse us. And we say, well, they didn't get married yet, so how is he calling her his wife? They were legally married at this point. So... We've talked about Mary and Joseph and who they are, so let's talk a little bit about what the angel says about the baby, if you will, which will take us this morning to our next point, the Messiah. Luke chapter 1, verses 31 through 33. You will be with child and will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Can you imagine for a minute? What it must have felt like to know the burden that you were going to bring in and carry in the world the long-awaited Messiah. And by the way, shoulder the responsibility as well as the heartbreak that was going to come with that. It must have been an overwhelming thing for a young lady and for a very young couple as well. Because by the way, we're talking about Joseph and Mary. We're talking about the average age at this time of marriage was somewhere between 12 and 15. But we're talking young people. The Messiah is first mentioned, by the way, in the garden. 
Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. So the coming of the Messiah was long awaited. There was no way that man in his sinful state could be with the Lord. The only way for forgiveness and that it could be received was to have a perfect substitute take our place and receive the full punishment of all of our sin. You see, we could not receive the full punishment of our sin and still be with the Lord. Because the death is the payment for sin. But after our payment, we're stuck in that state. We cannot change the physical death. We cannot change death physically or otherwise in our life. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So only Jesus, who by the way is God in person, who faced every temptation, faced every frustration, faced every form of mocking, every accusation, and yet still never sinned. And because of what Jesus did and had gone through, he understands our dilemma. He understands our struggles. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, he was able to offer himself as a sacrifice that would take away the sin of the world if we would choose to follow him and respond to the call for forgiveness. We all could be saved if we would do that. He has made a way for every single one of us to be able to be saved. He's made a way for that to happen. And because of that, we have no excuse not to respond. Gabriel said that his kingdom would never end, and it won't. You see, the people of God, those who are saved in Christ, the church will never end. Many kingdoms rise and fall, but the kingdom of God is forever. And we will speak much more about that part of the Messiah in a couple of weeks. But what is most important that we remember about Jesus is that he came to save his people, meaning the world. John three sixteen and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Now, that'll take us this morning to our next point, the how. Luke chapter 1, verses 34 through 37. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Lord, or the Holy Spirit, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One will be born, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Now, Mary asked a question that any person would ask. How can I have a child if I've never been with a man? And, by the way, that is a fair question to ask. And there's a reason that it's fair, because in our life, in our world, we have never seen a woman have a child without the assistance of a man, physical or otherwise. We've never seen that. But we're not talking about dealing in a normal human situation here. We are talking about dealing with the creator of all things, which includes, by the way, you and I. Now, why is that important? Because if you build a computer software and you program it to do many different and difficult tasks, by the way, as a designer of that software, you know how to make it do things that nobody else has a clue as to what it can do. In other words, you make your software do things that other people say is impossible. The designer always has that option because they created the program and because they created the program, they have the ability to override or bypass whatever function they want. Now, I know that you understand that logic. We've even seen it before. Anybody here who's ever messed around with a, a software knows that's possible. They've seen the back doors that allow you to do things that nobody else knows how to do. So why in the world would we ever wonder why a woman could never have a baby because she's never been with a man when the one who designed and created her is the one that's going to make it happen? It just doesn't make sense. Does he not have the ability to override and bypass any function that he created? Absolutely. I think we all know the logical answer to that question, and it is yes. 
All functionality in a process of having a baby can be worked around by the one who programmed the process, by the one who put it together, can easily be done. Now, it doesn't catch me off guard, by the way, when a non-believer struggles with the virgin birth, or by the way, with anything else in the Bible for that matter, what doesn't, why doesn't it catch me off guard? Simply this, because the struggle is out of ignorance. Now, I'm not talking about in the intelligence point of view. I'm talking about the fact that they've never studied it enough to actually see the evidence otherwise. What does catch me off guard with a non-believer is how they can claim to live in an evolutionary worldview where only the strong survive and only the fittest prosper, but then demand that there should be some kind of fairness or concern for the less fortunate. You see, from an evolutionary point of view, there is no need to care for those who are starving. There is no need to care for those who cannot take care of themselves. There's no need to care for the handicapped. From an evolved mindset, that's simply less competition for me. So let them go. That's what Darwin would say. Compassion, love, concern, fairness, those things belong to God, not evolution. Don't steal from God and call yourself a non-believer. That's what I don't get. That's what I don't understand. Margaret Sanger would go even further than that. Margaret Sanger says, kill them off. Kill them all. They don't deserve to reproduce. The poor should not have children. Only the intelligent, only the wealthy, only the rich should go through that. By the way, Margaret Sanger, if you're not sure who that is, is the founder of Planned Parenthood, the largest legalized institution of murder in the United States. So what does catch me off guard, though, from a Christian standpoint, is when a Christian struggles with the virgin birth. Now, some will say it's impossible for that to happen, and it is with man, but not with God. Again, I'll take you back to the whole software program analogy. Now, many believe other miracles of the Bible, but they struggle with this one, and I'm not really sure why. If you believe that God is capable of doing other miracles in the Bible, why would you struggle with this one? Well, I think I have a possible answer to that question. And that is, this is the one that most people have personal experience with. Most people have had or personally know somebody who's been part of the baby-making process. And so we know it so well. This process is one that we all know well compared to walking on water, compared to calling fire from heaven, compared to raising the dead. This is one that we know real well. The process of having babies is one that we know. It's been spoken of to to us by our parents as we were growing up. We've read about it in health classes. Other family members have talked about it in conversation. So this process we know very intimately, no pun intended. But when it comes to other miracles of the Bible, well, we don't really know those so well. But the same analogy of the programmer applies to all miracles as it does to the virgin birth. Let me define miracle, by the way. Miracle, according to dictionary.com, is this, quote unquote, an effect or extraordinary event in the physical world that surpasses all known human or natural powers and is ascribed to a supernatural cause. Yep, that's exactly what's happening here with Mary. And by the way, while Mary asks how could this be, when the angel gives her the answer, she is content with that. Why? Because of her tremendous faith in God. See, what was being said was this, Mary, what is about to happen to you is not based on what you're going to do. It is based on what God will do. So you just simply have to be a willing person. So the angel adds this, by the way, in Luke chapter 1, verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. And in the same manner of thinking, consider what Jesus himself later says to the disciples as well as the people gathered around in Matthew 19, verse 26. With man, this is impossible, but with God, All things are possible. See, there is nothing outside the realm of the Creator. He is the one that programmed all things. Certainly, He can work the programming whatever way He wants to fit His purpose, right? Well, there will be times that the Lord will work His way in our lives that you and I may not understand how in the world it's going to benefit God, how it's going to benefit us, or how it's going to benefit his kingdom. Just like Mary wasn't sure how in the world she was going to have a child, although she had never been with her husband. And there are times in our life when we're just going to have to rely upon the hand of God and not on our reasoning and on our understanding because you and I are very limited. Now, we think we know everything, but we don't. 
Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. He will make your paths straight. Does this sound anything familiar to maybe John? See, faith in all aspects of our life is a must because there are just some things that you and I cannot wrap our minds around. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And that is going to take me this morning to my last point. The last point is the response. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. See, the angel that Mary gave is the answer of complete faith and of complete courage. Now, why do I say courage? Because Mary knew what people would say about her. She knew what this would cause her to be or be seen as socially. But she also knew that if God was with her, he would be the one that would protect her no matter what. It didn't matter what the world thought if she knew what God thought. You see, I think we all know that God has a plan for our lives. I think we all know that he has created every single one of us based for his purpose to bring glory to his kingdom. Every one of us matter a great deal to him. And if you don't already know this today, then you need to know without a shadow of doubt, you are loved, you have a purpose, but how can God use you for his will? Are you willing to be used by God. And as I said last week, many people will immediately answer, oh yes, I'm willing to serve the Lord no matter what. Well, let me go ahead and ask you, there are plenty of things to be done right here at South Fork. Are you willing to serve the Lord? What can you do to help fulfill the Great Commission? Please understand that all of us can be used by God. The question is, are we willing? Are we willing? Mary was. And because she was willing, she is still called to this day blessed among women. Are you willing to work in the kingdom of God no matter what it costs you? Friends, I invite you today to accept the grace of God by faith in what Jesus Christ did for you at Calvary's cross and in Christian baptism, bury your old self and arise as a new person in Christ ready to begin living out what God created you to do. Now here's the facts. God created every single one of us with a purpose and with a plan. He is going to use you for his will if you are willing. What are you going to do? 